Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this, this evening's Schmidt Lecture. Uh, as you all know, the uh, Arthur J. Schmidt Endowed Lectures began in 2001, and they, we, we have them twice a year, each fall and spring, and they are typically on the broad themes of ethical and religious perspectives that are connected to engineering and science. Uh, the goal of this lecture series is to bring uh, in distinguished speakers from around the world, attracting speakers of the highest quality, Nobel laureates, outstanding scientists, physicians, engineers, and leading philosophers and theologians as well. Um, this, uh, this is endowed by the Arthur J. Smith Foundation through a very generous uh, grant, uh, which dates back to uh, 1975 in terms of the relationship with that foundation to Notre Dame. And the grants have been used to support uh, one endowed professorship as well as fellowships uh, split between the colleges of engineering and scientists, or in science rather, and the Arthur J. Schmidt Chair in Chemical Engineering was established in 1983. And we'd like to extend a special welcome this evening to the Schmidt Fellows as well as to any members of the Schmidt Foundation board members uh, of the Schmidt Foundation's board who are in attendance this evening. And just uh, before I introduce our speaker this evening, let me just say one brief word about, about Arthur J. Schmidt himself. Of course, he was an inventor a CEO and philanthropist who devoted his resources to promoting his strong Christian principles and ideals. In his, in his work, he founded a prestigious international firm known as the American Phenolic Corporation, whose uh, electronic expertise served the United States, especially during World War II. <clears throat> and um, and uh, Mr. Schmidt uh, formed a private foundation with the, uh, the funds from his royalties on his patents, and has uh, been the beneficiary of many endeavors, including especially this, this program this evening. Now tonight, um, we are welcoming Dr. Paul McHugh, who is the University Distinguished Service Professor of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce him this evening and to give you some background and information on Dr. McHugh before he, before he delivers his remarks. Paul was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, attended the Har Harvard College and Harvard Medical School, and thereafter he studied with George Thorne, the physician-in-chief of what is now called the Brigham and Williams Hospital. And while studying there and, and under the tutelage of, of Dr. Thorne, he saw for the first time the vexed complexities and difficulties uh, that have bedeviled the study and practice of psychiatry, certainly then and even, and even now. And he uh, saw and pioneered a novel and fruitful path forward in response to these concerns one that emphasized rigor in the biological sciences as a hedge against the tendency to fill the vacuum created by uncertainty with ideology uh, and the subsequent uh, creation of disciplinary tribalism that follows from that sort of reliance. So instead, he pursued a residency in neurology and neuropathology. Uh, tra his training and practice took him to the Institute of Psychiatry in London, uh, the Division of Neuropsychiatry at Walter Reed, Cornell, and the Oregon Health Sciences Center, but uh, in 1972, he, he arrived at Johns Hopkins and served there from 1975, rather, from 75 until 2001. He served as the Henry Phipps Professor of Psychiatry and the Director of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, as well as the Psychiatrist in, in Chief at, at Johns Hopkins. While he was there, he transformed what was a flagging institution into a world famous model of excellence, with which, excellence which, which we're, with which we're all familiar. Now, Paul has spent his life engaging the most challenging problems uh, in his field and has never shied away from speaking the truth to powerful people. He has fearlessly challenged the central animating orthodoxies of psychiatry and has served as a living example of the practice of the art of medicine. He, uh, he is a man of science, but he's also deeply humane and attuned to the needs of the human person. And this was captured in uh, novelist Tom Wolfe's dedication to Paul of his novel, A Man in Full, in which he, he said uh, that Paul, uh, Paul McHugh is a man whose brilliance, comradeship, and unfailing kindness save the day in respect to uh, Tom Wolfe's own, own treatment following his uh, 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 coronary surgery. Paul is the author of multiple books and hundreds of scholarly papers, uh, and so we're very fortunate to have him here this, this evening. And, it, and as I said at the beginning, it's a special pleasure for me to introduce Paul because I had the honor of working with him for several years during his service on the President's Council on Bioethics, and he was then and is now a role model for me personally of uh, courageous, civil, thoughtful, and spirited engagement in the public square on the deepest questions at the heart of the practice of medicine and at what, what it means to be a human being. And so I give you, without further ado, Dr. Paul McHugh. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Carter. And thank you all for coming out on this snowy day. I've come from sunny Baltimore. And, uh, and interestingly enough, as a few of you in the audience might know, I was to come a year ago uh, and uh, give this lecture. And on the very morning as I went out to the car to take me to the airport, I was struck with a coronary problem. I told the car to take me directly to the hospital. I sent uh, David Carter a brief email saying, I'm going in the coronary care. And I thought no one would ever want me to come to Notre Dame again. So I'm very thrilled that they did re-invite me. I'm here today. And by the way, I was driven to the airport by the same driver that took me. <laughs> so uh, to some extent, it's, uh, it's a, a double pleasure to be here and to be able to talk with you today. Uh, I'm very honored uh, and grateful to the Schmidt uh, uh, Lecture Group who have invited me. And uh, of course, to Mr. Schmidt for endowing this lectureship and making it possible for me to come to Notre Dame. I have uh, a, a talk today uh, to give you, and as usual, I have more slides than I should bring. Uh, it's a, a constitutional problem of mine when trying to tell a story. But the story is really the story about a, uh, a remarkable misdirection in psychiatry that uh, I was uh, uh, fighting at uh, one time. Uh, and I thought I'd tell you that story uh, in, in the context of uh, the... Uh, of what to understand about contemporary psychiatry and uh, what it's vulnerable to, and uh, at the same time, uh, how we can uh, avoid things of this sort in the future. And so I've titled An Occasion of the Abuse uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the Public by Psychiatry, but what it teaches. And it's, uh, this, uh, this whole story is involved in, is written up in this book that I wrote called Try to Remember about a year or two ago. And uh, the book uh, uh, really uh, has three parts to it. it has, there's an aspect of it as a memoir to tell you, well, you know, how did I get into this spot? Uh, there's an aspect of telling the whole story of the uh, misadventure. And then there's a little how-to aspect of the book, because really the, the big problem with a misadventure in medicine is that the public learns about it and then doesn't know how to find good quality experiences. And so there's an aspect of the book that talks about uh, how to find good psychotherapy uh, and what psychotherapy really does. It tries to take the mystery out of that, uh, um, uh, out of that term and that practice. But there is a little subtext to the book, and there's a subtext to what I'm saying. The subtext really is this, that psychiatry is a really a, a medical and scientific discipline, about at the level of chemistry before Mendeleev and the periodic table. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really different in that sense. And the therapeutic practices with patients are mostly rule of thumb. They, they, they do, we do good things, but we uh, you know, often don't quite know why it works and uh, Sometimes the results are haphazard, and you might have remembered that about a year ago, um, uh, Newsweek had a cover that said, depression doesn't work, uh, and antidepressants don't work, and you flipped it upside down and said, antidepressants do work. It's that kind of thing. And, and it's my point, and the subtext of this lecture, until the medical discipline, this one, finds the conceptual principles that render its disorders intelligible, it will remain vulnerable to crank ideas and to factions. And uh, that's really the subtext of what I'm saying. But briefly, just the memoir. To start really with the memoir, what, 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 is, what, what really happened? What's been happening in psychiatry for this last century or so? It's, that's very interesting. And I could give a long talk on that um, in the sense that psychiatry goes through phases of about 30 years, about a generation long, in which a particular idea dominates for a while. And then it, it domi it's, it's kind of like a fashion. It, it, it runs out of steam. And then it's replaced by another one. And uh, uh, the 20th century has really broken up into uh, these three epochs. Uh, uh, the, from 1910 to about 1940, I refer to the Meyer epoch. That's... Uh, uh, following the directions of Adolf Meyer from Johns Hopkins, who really um, taught people how to take cases. He was a wonderful psychiatrist in one sense. He, he taught you how to really uh, take a good, solid history and an examination of patients. 
Um, but the histories would be as long as gone with the wind, and uh, he didn't know anything more about what to do, except he said, if you look closely in there, you'll find the problem. And uh, 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 that, uh, it became enthusiastic at first because it seemed so positive, but after a while it petered out until along came the Freudians who said, you don't have to look at everything. Everything is as important for people. The really important stuff is that sexual stuff. And boy, that took off. And, uh, and it, you didn't, no longer did you have to think about uh, all of life, but this particular part of it. And, uh, and, and it, uh, uh, as Maya faded, and uh, uh, fundamentally with Nazi persecution, there was a, uh, an influx of uh, analysts into America, and, and they, they dominated the field. I, I emerged in medical school about right here. And what... Todd has given you a little idea of what I, I've been about, but really the important thing to, to re, uh, that I'd like to tell you is I, I was in the medical s school and going from unit to unit, the cardiology unit, the neurology unit, and in all those units, the doctors and nurses were interested in the patients. When you went into the psychiatry units, the doctors and nurses were interested in each other. You know, where, where, where are you and your analyst? Where are you doing? And the, the patients were there, but the, and I, 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 that kind of turned me off a little. And it finally turned most people off because uh, along came a variety of treatments like uh, lithium or chlorpromazine, discovered by accident, but that worked for particular disorders. And uh, uh, the Kennedy Mental Health Act uh, uh, encouraged people to leave, uh, be, encouraged doctors to take people out of the hospital, the the state hospital bring them into the cities, but the, the, the psychiatrists didn't know much how to do, take care of them there. They then wandered around. And uh, um, then a, a new period began, the, the empirical period, in which uh, w I, I'm saying it's petering out here, and I caught, put a close here. Perhaps, perhaps it's got more energy than I'm saying, but this is the problem now. And what, 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 did, they do? what did they do? They... they, they uh, they produced a new approach to psychiatry, which is represented by this DSM things you hear about, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, in which a new way of thinking about psychiatric patients appeared about 1980. And um, um, the DSM uh, was first thought to be a kind of uh, dictionary or a form of uh, defining uh, disorders by their characteristics and not thinking about what their causes or mechanisms were behind them. But actually, it turns out to be a field guide. Um, it, it, um, it says, we no longer are going to care about what the generative causes of mental illnesses are, because it's just too fraught an issue. It causes all kinds of trouble. All we're going to do is make sure everybody knows what we mean by schizophrenia, uh, depression, uh, uh, ADHD, what have you, because we're going to just ask S experts to tell us what are the primary symptoms that identify these conditions, and, and we'll all agree, okay? And then we'll start treating them. Well, you know, the, the problem with a field guide is it's very, very accurate. Here is from Roger Torrey Peterson's I don't know how many birders I have in the room, but uh, everybody knows the, the marvelous field guides of Ro Roger Terry Peterson, who, who said, I'm going to help people to identify birds on the fly in the field by identifying those very characteristics which mark them uh, that are easily identified and recognized. And here is uh, his picture on the, of the, the European starling. And uh, um, these are the, the marks that make him clear. And uh, the fact is that the European starling is the only black bird in North America with a yellow bill. Now you know how to identify it. And that's similarly in psychiatry. But what do you know about the starling by just being able to give them the name? Why are there so many starlings? What's the, the niche that made them so successful? And why is it called a European starling? All of those things are aspects of the ornithology of this bird. Um, the story is that there are a lot of stallings in America because uh, in the 1890s, there was a fellow in New York who thought we should have 
all the birds in North America that are mentioned in Shakespeare and released 15 pairs of starlings in Central Park in New York. Now that's, now that's a piece of information. Similarly with psychiatry, we now know, we seem to know what kinds of symptoms identify one particular disorder and separate it from another, but we don't know what causes it, what its nature is, what its essence is, and that's a problem, okay? And that problem produces this kind of psychiatrist. Instead of somebody thinking about what is behind a disorder, here, here's this little cartoon from the Wall Street Journal. He's kind of trying to check and see if he can get the diagnosis from what the patient looks like rather than the essence of what the patient has. And uh, here is a re well, you know you're in trouble when either Doonesbury or the New Yorker begins to make fun of you. And here's a little cartoon that says, here's a, a lawyer speaking to a, 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 a criminal, and he says, great news, we found a syndrome that fits your case like a glove. And that's part of the, that's really the problem. Uh, ha, given that background, what was this encounter? What, what happened uh, that uh, this... Uh, issue or background made possible, and that's the next section of the things. What happened was um, the Freudian ideas had died away uh, in, some, in their energies, but what happened was a new claim, particularly a claim uh, related to uh, um, some symptoms that patients said, were said to show, uh, developed uh, in, in America, the so-called multiple personality disorder, and I'm going to show you that. Why is it a Freudian heresy? It's probably worthwhile going over what is the, uh, the simplest foundations of the Freudian idea. Freud, uh, in his depth psychology, um, uh, had uh, produced a set of theories that were, were, were intended to explain human behavior uh, and, and in relationship to unconscious conflicts. And he, his central proposition was that the unconscious mind wilts before the power of the society and demands conformity of the person to the culture. And the self-promoting feelings, desires, and thoughts, especially in the infant and child, are repressed by the, um, by the society. And this repression eventually leads to disruptions in uh, life plans, habits, uh, and psychological stability, and produces depression, anxiety, and other psychoses. That's Freud in a nutshell, okay? The, the point is, the idea is, we, he, he thought, are struggling with our selfish aims, usually aims driven by uh, our uh, self-interest, and particularly our sexual motivations, and particularly in infancy, those are crushed by the, uh, the family uh, holding us back, hold, and ultimately civilizing us, but at a price, the price of pre prevention uh, and, and repression. Um, this, uh, this idea petered out, but right here, at the time it was petering out, along came this heresy in about 1973 in a book entitled Sybil, in which uh, a psychiatrist and a, and a writer from New York um, uh, reported a case of a uh, young woman who... Um, the psychoanalyst said had and represented seven different personalities. And uh, although per multiple personality had been around before, you remember the three prices, faces of Eve was back in the 60s, uh, what uh, uh, Cornelia Wilbur, the psychiatrist, said was this actually, the personality breakup and the several personalities that were seen were due to the abuse of this person as a child by her abusive mother, in this case. She was sexually abused, and that terrible trauma of being sexually abused had been repressed by the girl, but uh, led to the breakup of the, of the personality into several different memories or altars that could remember bits and pieces of it, but were never uh, brought together, okay? And, uh, this, uh, this idea uh, 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 that what, the reason it's a Freudian heresy, instead of the, the subject being the person that's trying to push out and uh, gain its own uh, way in the world and in the process is held back from selfish motives, uh, now it's the opposite. 
the, 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 uh, ourselves or our individuals are crushed by the paternity, but usually by the father who is cruelly abusing us and uh, for his pleasures, and that that uh, uh, recognition that life is so cruel is unable to be uh, tolerated and uh, breaks the unconscious, uh, uh, hides the reality from the person and... Uh, ultimately breaks itself up into, into a variety of personalities. Hence this idea that moral authority, instead of being something that's shaping the person, is victimizing the person. And uh, that, that, that took off, that idea took off during the empirical era for a number of reasons. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about them. But the first and most important point was that this idea flew in the face of all previous thought about uh, both multiple personality uh, uh, in, 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 in psychiatric tradition. Previous to, uh, to uh, Sybil, the idea was that multiple personalities were thought to be artificial productions, the product of the medical attention that they aroused, that the, the doctors, in fact, uh, were generating it by the interest that they showed in, 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 in the person who... Who, who appeared. I don't know if you've seen The Three Faces of Eve, but Joan Woodward plays in that. And uh, you, if you notice the way the doctors treat her, you can see how they've, in part, generated the interest. But anyway, this was the previous, uh, thing, uh, previous thought. And uh, I can tell you what's developing multiple personality in patients today or, or at this time was, was fit that uh, idea like a glove. Here is a, 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 a psychiatrist of the multiple personality persuasion showing you how you bring forth or elicit the uh, alter personalities, the various uh, abnormal persons. And here, here is what he says. This is, this is written about 1985. The sine qua non of MPD is a second personality that sometimes comes out and takes executive control of the patient's behavior. It may happen that an alter personality will reveal itself to you during this process, that is, during the examination. But more likely it will not. You have to elicit an alter personality. To begin the process of eliciting an alter, you can begin by indirect. That's my sick, because I want you to notice how indirect this questioning is such as, have you ever felt like another part of you does things that you can't control? <laughs> that's pretty indirect, right? If she, and that's his uh, pronomial gender, gives, and, and many of them, essentially 85% are women, if she gives positive or ambiguous responses, ask for specific examples. You're trying to develop a picture of what the alter personality is like. At this point, you might ask the host personality, does this set of feelings have a name? That's an interesting interaction between you and a doctor, isn't it? Occasionally you'll get a name. Often the host personality will not know. You can then focus on a particular event or set of behaviors and follow up on those. For instance, you can ask, can I talk to the part of you who's taking those long drives to the country? Now, if the patient says anything other than, what do you mean? <laughs> it's just me taking those drives, then you're into this. And uh, the assumptive world of the psychiatrist, and remember, these are patients who are coming to a doctor asking for help in some kind of way, faced with these questions, they often will say, well, okay, I, I guess you, you must know something. And, uh, and you're off to the races. Now, we know that doctors tend uh, and have tended, and psychiatrists in particular, have tended to evoke personalities and ev evoke behaviors in patients. And the classic example of that is this picture. Many of you may have seen. This is the, this is the great uh, neuropsychiatrist Charcot in the Salpetriere in the, uh, uh, about uh, 1870 uh, with his famous uh, hysteroepilepsy patients in which e every... Uh, uh, Thursday noon, he would invite uh, uh, a crowd of uh, psychiatrists and interested people into the Salpetriere to have a demonstration of a patient. And uh, he uh, uh, thought that uh, as he was examining many patients uh, for epilepsy, that he was also seeing a new form of epilepsy in which particularly young women would throw themselves down and, and, uh, and display themselves in, in strange contorted ways. And he thought he'd found a new, a new disorder. He had been a fam he was a very famous uh, neurologist and had discovered many new diseases, but this was so-called hysteroepilepsy until this fella, this is Joseph Babinski, 
his assistant said, you know, uh, Professor, I think we're eliciting these behaviors, not discovering them, and then began to advise that we stop having such shows for these people, and this behavior stopped. And that was the, that's the kind of b background previous to ideas of what psychiatrists can do. <clears throat> but with the multiple personality story, after, uh, after uh, Sybil and all, it, it went wild. We began to have, uh, here's a, an example of 17 personalities being drawn by one of them. One of them is drawing, showing them the various kinds of uh, personalities that one person can have, males, females, young people, crippled, uh, ch uh, tiny children, uh, all sorts of stuff. And uh, not only did, it, did, it, did the idea of multiple personality with being abused as a, as a child um, uh, develop uh, through these suggestions, but not only did they begin to think that you could be abused by your parents, it was first developed that maybe your parents, in fact, were abusing you, not simply for their own sexual gratification, but because they were members of a satanic cult. And, uh, and the idea that uh, many satanic cults were uh, present in the United States and sprang up around and were abusing children appeared in this book, Michelle Remembered. And uh, then in psy many psychiatric centers, they began to be interested in witch calendars and tell you all stuff from the Middle Ages that, uh, that uh, we thought were uh, long gone. And then finally, the uh, ultimate extension of this was that the, uh, maybe a multiple personality was due to the fact that you'd been carried off by aliens to the asteroid belt and abused up there. And, uh, and it, it, what, it, what had happened was that once you had uh, given over the idea that uh, uh, multiple personality was real and represented something that the doctors and the patients could uh, draw out with hypnosis and suggestion, then the kinds of things that could be behind it were, uh, became more and more wild and weird and uh, uh, um, were, were represented in various places. I just want to give you an example of one. Now, now remember, uh, the, I, I saw these cases developing and being cared for throughout the country, but m the most interesting studies were often in academic centers committed to this idea. Here is a, a piece taken directly from a medical record in a, an academic medical center in Chicago in which uh, the family history of the patient is reported here. And the, uh, the, it says, on both sides of her family, Patty, uh, there's a long history dating back to the 15th century in Croatia of satanic cult involvement at the highest levels of authority, royal bloodlines. 15th century, that's, you know, 1400s. I try to get my, my young doctors to take a, a family history, but this, this is really good. <laughs> Going back to the 1400s. Patty describes her, her parents' relationships as very distant, with their only common interest being hunting. Her life with her parents, according to Patty, is characterized solely by satanic cult involvement which was an ever-present subjection to ritualized torture, human sacrifice, and cannibalism, so she has no memory of normal life events, if there were any. This, this as I say, this is a, this is a record. And, but look, what are the implications of a claim to direct descent from 15th century Croatia? It, it, it said that we must have detailed knowledge of a culture in a European backwater prior to Columbus? that the presumptive information about an ancestral lineage extended back about 20 generations, and the size of an ancestral pool 20 generations back for any individual is calculated as 2 to the 20th power or a million, more than a million people. And at this hospital, they knew that on that million people, this person had um, uh, sa uh, satanic cults, and they were still working their, their injury on, on them. In 1988 came a book, uh, The Courage to Heal, sometimes referred to as the Bible of this, in which uh, um, the, the idea of the sexual abuse was, um, was emphasized. And, uh, and uh, several quotes from here are here. It's, no one ever, we talked to ever thought she might have been abused and then discovered she hadn't been. 
The progression always goes the other way from suspicious to confirmation. If you think you're abused and your life shows the symptoms, then you probably were. Uh, there's, no, there's no evidence for any of that. Uh, most sexual abuse is remembered. If you sense that you were sexually abused and have no memories of it, it's likely that you were. Spend time imagining that you were sexually abused and without worrying about accuracy or having your ideas make sense. When you feel ready, ask yourself, who would have, like been, the, who would have been the likely perpetrators? Now, this is the problem. Once you have persuaded the person that they've got multiple personality, and you persuade them that that must mean that they've been sexually abused, and then you tell them, just dream about who might have done it, that's when a terrible persecution got started. And in over a million families in America, um, people were, were broken up because one of their members began to accuse them, never before having any difficulty in the family, but now accusing them of a recovered memory of sexual abuse out of, uh, through ideas of this sort. Uh, and uh, a huge... Um, uh, um, this is just one sample, but a, but a huge uh, epidemic of, uh, of sexual abuse uh, claims uh, went into courts. Uh, several people went to jail, and uh, I'm going to talk to you how, this came, how it came down on the other side. But it was all generated out of the two, this combination that all you had to do was find symptoms, and the symptoms permitted you to make a diagnosis, but the, this diagnosis had a particular meaning. How, 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 did, how did it work out? Uh, how did we work it out, uh, ultimately? Well, the first thing we did was identifying it as a kind of Charcot hysteria, that it was being uh, de developed by the person, uh, the, the doctors themselves. And if you, uh, did some, uh, if you did certain things and recognized that many of the symptoms, such as multiple personality, were, were generated that way, and separated the patients from all instruction of that sort, then most of the time it disappeared. You could make counter-suggestions like simply mo uh, removing attention. Our rule at Hopkins, and we would get several of these patients that would come in, um, it, it was interesting. We, 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 we weren't out looking for patients of this sort uh, with multiple personality, but they would sometimes come in with other symptoms. They would come in and say, well, I've got anorexia nervosa, or I've got uh, depression of some sort. So you take care of the anorexia nervosa, and my therapist will take care of my multiple personality. And we would just say, no, we, we, I think we should just take care of one thing. Multiple personality is too tough for us, but it might be too tough for everybody if we're working on anorexia nervosa. So we would say, we only talk to one person, not several altars, and believe it or not, in a few weeks, the altars would all fall away, and uh, the focus on anorexia nervosa would be useful, and, and, and that was the first thing. Getting rid of the multiple personality was not the hard part. The hard part was, uh, um, if you just ignored the altars, they ultimately disappeared giving a good credence for the idea that you got the altars because people were asking you more and more about them. It was the memories that were the big problem. The memories were much different. It's hard to ignore the memories because the patient kept saying, you know, I think I've, got, I've developed these memories. I, what, what do they mean? And uh, there was lots of reasons for being skeptical about the memories. Uh, uh, it's not, it, it doesn't mean that, by the way, the sexual abuse doesn't happen, but that Many of these memories were not what you would expect memories to be. Uh, many of them were occurring from the time of infantile amnesia. I had a patient say to me, I know I was sexually abused. I remember it right now. It was um, before I knew how to speak, and while my father was changing my diapers at age 11 months, he and his friend abused me, and I screamed out, and I remember it very vividly, screaming out in anger against him, but couldn't use the words for it. Well, you know, that, that's not very likely. Uh, they, they cut off communication with anybody who didn't validate it, and the, many of the memories were recovered by hypnosis and guided imaging, sodium amytal and the like, and uh, many of the presumptions were based on the current symptoms, the assumption of abuse was based simply on the fact that the patient reported multiple personality. And, there was no memory of these of events until midlife. Not at all like the kind of experiences and thoughts that people have who, who were sexually abused and harbor concerns about that all their life. So 
What did we say ought to happen in relationship to the study of the memory? We, we thought that we should um, uh, get our, our doctors to study the genesis of the memory itself. When did it come up? What, was, what really was its content? Was it, was it logical and sensible? We, we did seek its confirmation. We went out, we called people up and said, could this have possibly happened? What evidence did we have from school reports or things of this sort that the person was injured? And we did a, 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 a treat the accompanying s- syndromes of depression and anorexia nervosa, which often were the reasons why the person went to, the, to see the doctor originally. We didn't talk to the patient about this idea of repression and uh, multiplicity. We didn't send them uh, to read The Courage to Heal. We didn't prescribe that they go to groups where other people are together talking about their personality and experience. And we never encouraged a memory with hypnosis. And uh, in fact, we approached the problem this way. Uh, We we said that, look, uh, you can, this, is, this is a two-by-two two table. Uh, uh, psychiatric epidemiologists say all life is a two-by-two two table, and there, there's some truth to that. You, we always use these to, to solve problems of this sort. And it says that, look, um, the truth of the matter is that the world is, can be broken up into two groups of people, those who have been abused and those who have not been abused. And so we, we have these two columns. And, uh, but also... The world can be split up into those who have a memory of being abused and those who have no memory of being abused, okay? And we, when we cross these rows with these columns, we get these four um, uh, uh, cells. And look, there are people in all of these cells when you go out and look. There are people who have been abused and have a memory of it. We'll call them a hit. Fortunately, there are plenty of people who have not been amused, abused and have no memory of it, the unaffected. Then there are people who have been abused and have, have, have no memory of it. They've forgotten it. They may have forgotten it because they didn't know it was abuse at the time. They may have forgotten it because it was too early. They may have forgotten it just the way we forget anything. They, they belong in this cell, the forgotten cell. And then there are some people who have been, not been abused but have a memory of it, like those people who believe that they were abused by aliens in spacecraft and the like. And so we can call them false alarm patients, okay? And the problem, though, is not putting a patient in the cell. The problem is how to deal with a person who comes in and says, I didn't have a memory, but now I've recovered a memory. That's the psychiatric problem. The the diagnostic issue is, if you've recovered a memory, did you go up this column from forgotten to hit, or did you go up this column from unaffected to false alarm? And that's what you've got to look for evidence for in relationship to how the memory developed, who who confirms it, and the like. Now, are you... you, Positive uh, when you make a decision for either column. I don't think you can be positive about this until things work out further. But if you haven't considered that this column could do the same thing as this column, which was the idea going forward, then you've neglected your professional responsibility. No one would have gotten into the kind of... Um, malpractice claims that they got into uh, and were settled only with millions of dollars if they had considered uh, uh, both columns and then for a while had decided on this and were mistaken. Nobody was going to give millions of dollars of uh, problems to somebody who made a mistake like that. But most of the time, nobody ever considered that this could be happening and, in fact, generated by the, theme, the theories of today. Uh, eventually, eventually, the state in many states came, came uh, out in malpractice claims, and this issue ended not because the psychiatrists in power decided to write up the mistakes, but because the court said, you are abu- the therapists are abusing the family by not demanding proper treatment. 
uh, and proper assessments of the patients. And millions of dollars were, were, were given, and the insurance companies were the ones that pulled back and said, no more multiple, pi- di- multiple, personal di- multiple personality diagnoses, no more any of this stuff. And, it, and, 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 and the pseudo-memories disappeared, and uh, most of them have de- de- there was one big contribution to this problem besides the, the, the sense that I've given you. The one contribution was a confusion over professional action and responsibility. And it really derives from uh, an idea from Max Weber, who was interested in, in uh, social political problems and what, how social political problems get into conflicts. And he talks about two forms of ethics um, in relationships that can be turned into professional uh, 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 ethics, an ethics of responsibility where people consider standards and consequences of their behavior, an ethics of conviction where people are are driven by ideals and and, and particular forms of conduct. Now, most professionals try to combine the two. They try to be both responsible and work on their convictions. The real problem here was that people of conviction uh, were prepared to push forward regardless of the outcome and implications, uh, and they do things like this. Listen, if you're, 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 you must be abused if your body uh, gives you funny messages uh, uh, and uh, you're having trouble with intimacy. And uh, Judith Herman said, look, after, if after ref- careful reflections our patients make the decision to speak publicly and seek justice, we will be called upon to stand with them. I hope we can show as much courage as the patients do. We'll accept the honor of bearing witness and stand with them when they declare, we remember the crimes committed against us. We remember we're not alone. We are not afraid to tell the truth. When you see, hear that, you know, you think, yeah, I'm with you, Judith. I'm going. Let's go. These are awful things that happen to these people, and I'm on your side. But then in the next paragraph, she said, but as therapists, we're not detectives. We're not fact finders. Our job is to help patients make meaning out of their experience. Now, wait, I thought we were supposed to find truth about the experience here. Finding meaning is a different story. And often, the finding the meaning was the meaning of the therapist and not, not, not much else. The no- finally, uh, lately, the notion that the mind protects itself by repressing or dissociating memories of trauma, rendering them inaccessible to awareness, is a piece of psychiatric folklore devoid of convincing empirical research and support, my friend. The greater problem, though, was that the great enemy of truth, as John Kennedy said at Yale, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest. I don't believe that was it. But the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. We've seen that in other things. Here's the Salem witch trials. Very similar kind of thing swept the, swept the nation. And what we were dealing with really was a psychiatric craze. And I don't know if you've ever thought much about crazes and how they get started and how they build up, but we have various ones, innocent crazes like the hula hoop, uh, racist crazes that led to the Holocaust and other kinds of things. But the, uh, uh, um, uh, Lionel Penrose spelled it out and said that, look, the interesting thing is that they tend to fall in several similar, follow a similar course, a latent phase where the idea is in a few minds but not spreading, as when uh, Wilbur first uh, uh, brought out her Sybil, then an an explosive phase when the idea spreads exponentially within a community of interested people, a saturation phase when the market of susceptible minds in the community becomes saturated, the number of new converts slackens, and then an immunity phase when the resistance to the idea develops within the community, enthusiasm weakens for it, even amongst the initially involved, and usually the immunity phase is pressed and in this case was pressed by uh, law enforcement uh, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, malpractice trials. And then it enters, a, it enters a stagnant phase where the idea fades away, except perhaps in the minds of a few enthusiasts. And I have to tell you that there's still a few enthusiasts for uh, uh, recovered memories. Uh, they no longer refer to themselves as multiple personality doctors. They talk of themselves as trauma doctors. And... Um, uh, here is an exact uh, depiction of what we saw and very like what uh, Penrose described. What can be done to avoid repetitions? Well, we've got to get beyond the idea that the best thing that psychiatrists can do is to find 
uh, a field guide approach to diagnosis. We need another approach, an approach to the diagnosis and identification of psychiatric patients just like in medicine, where we're interested in more coherent and truthful generative uh, causes. And uh, I wrote another book on just that that attended, that's entitled The Perspectives of Psychiatry, but that's another lecture. So thank you very much. <laughs> Now, I'll call on people, and I neglected to mention in my introduction that there is a reception meeting following uh, our, our question period. So if you'd like to raise your hand, I'll raise We're going to have a reception afterwards as well, so you can answer some questions here and then go next door. Exactly. Yeah. So raise your hand and you can recognize it. Yes, Jerry Brandon. Uh, I wanted Dr. McHugh, you talking about how the profession got going with trying to find meaning in the symptoms and the disorder that was reported by people, and you remarked that when we're grabbing our front and after the truth about what happened, I wonder if for what it's worth, and I don't suggest it's worth a lot, whether the story that they were telling themselves and talking to patients and trying to make sense of a patient's condition and find meaning in their condition, did that in itself help the patients much at all? Well, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, that's always a very interesting question. Uh, uh, can you... Uh, uh, decide in psychotherapy that a story seems to work and help the patient at the time, even though the patient, by the way, this years later may come up to you and say, Dr. McHugh, it was really wonderful. You really helped me a lot. But you remember that story you told me that it was my um, uh, um, shyness that was the, the problem? Well, actually, was, I've, I've, I've thought more about it. You've got me to think psychologically. And I, actually, I think it was, in fact, my jealousy about my sister. Uh, but whatever, the story has worked to help me uh, to make sense of things. The real problem with this, and I didn't show you the data, was this story here was to say that the people that you most trusted, the people that raised you, the people who cared for you, were the people that were the most evil and the most responsible for the illnesses that you're suffering. Uh, this story was a very destructive story, and uh, it produced, in fact, uh, and I, I, I should have shown you that, many more um, um, uh, troubles for patients uh, than help. More of these patients fell out of their marriages. More of them lost their work. More of them became uh, people on welfare. And uh, usually psychotherapy doesn't, uh, doesn't have that happen. And in this case, it was because of the story having this uh, poisonous meaning to it. By the way, the patients trusted their doctors and often would say, look, I, I believe I'm working something out and he's telling me that I'm getting, that I'll get better this way. But in order to get better, I have to get worse. Being worse would last for, for years. And finally, a little story. Uh, 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 there was a time when whenever I went uh, to any uh, institution in America, I was always shown uh, a patient. And I went to Charlotte uh, of this sort. I went to Charlotte, North Carolina once to... Uh, be, be shown a patient, oh, this patient had recovered on pretty much on her own. And the doctor who presented it to her said, presented him, her to me, said, uh, I took this patient from uh, another doctor on referral and I started treating her the way the books say I should. But then I gave her a little vacation simply because she seemed tired. She went away for three weeks and came back and she said, I'm cured. None of that happened. It was all in my mind. She said, uh, in fact, when I would come to you, often after a week away, I would be just like a hoop about to fall over, feeling better. And then you'd give it a whack. And by taking three weeks off, I, I realized it wasn't true. So, yes, the answer is very often, and the goodwill of these doctors are that they're trying to find a story that would be helpful. This story given as it was without any confirmation, had such poisonous qualities to it, in fact, it hurt people, and it uh, broke up millions of families. And, um, and uh, it, it, the troubles are, are not over yet. By the way, uh, the malpractice suits uh, ran into uh, many millions, and uh, that, more than anything else, put an end to it. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. To what extent did um, misdiagnosis or maybe just an underlying pathology like 
this is not my feeling, yep. but like a delusional disorder or something makes someone particularly susceptible yes. to this sort yes. of that question, what, were people perhaps susceptible to take up the idea of multiple personality and this idea of, uh, of uh, 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 repressed memory because they were already ill? Uh, I, I, in fact, I believe that they were. Uh, some of them were very seriously ill with serious schizophrenia, but most of them were not. Most of them were troubled with depression and um, anxiety, and they would go to a therapist. And by the way, the, the there are so many therapists, and uh, the, uh, the um, um, uh, right to call yourself a therapist is not licensed. You, you can essentially go out into a field, put your hand on a rock, and say, I am a therapist, and set up business. And uh, uh, so patients went to see uh, these uh, uh, people. And uh, in this book, Try to Remember, I describe two kinds uh, of, of therapists. Uh, uh, and they usually were, they didn't go just for the heck of it. They didn't go because they thought they had multiple personality, although eventually, after a while, some did, because they saw it on TV, there would be a little flurry. Of, but most of the time, they went because they had uh, some trouble, some distress, and they were looking for help, and they were susceptible to a suggestion, just as the patients that Charcot was seeing were susceptible to suggestion. And the suggestion was rather promptly given to them, asking them, first of all, can you talk to me about other personalities that are driving you? And then say, well, I have to tell you that you may not remember it, but I know that you have the signs that mean that you were sexually abused in your childhood, and that sexual abuse is what's causing your anxiety. We need to uh, drag that up. We need to draw that out, just as I say, in, uh, as a Freudian heresy might be, try to get you to understand, bring to light what are the conflicts in your unconscious. Yes, there's a, in the back. Uh, how long would these false memories stay with, how long would these false memories stay with people after, you know, they, you realize that, you know, this has been elicited from them? Would it, would it still seem real to a person after a while, or would they soon realize that, actually, I was just making it up? Or That's a very interesting question, and many of them, uh, it would, um, it, 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 they, they would come to realize, uh, well, for example, one patient uh, that uh, was in the hospital, um, she was been in the hospital for two years on a unit constantly talking about these matters. And uh, she, she, she and her husband finally said, well, you know, uh, it's hard to believe that uh, this could be happening back in good old Des Moines. She came from Des Moines and was in Chicago. And... Uh, she was being told that she had belonged to the, she's Patty, the one in the, uh, from Croatia. And uh, cannibalism was very important. So she sent her husband back to Des Moines to get some hamburger from the uh, local grocer to bring it back to the hospital in Chicago to see if there was any human flesh in there, thinking that the, the, the cannibals or the, the cult was going strong. And with a few things like that, including a visit back, she began to doubt but it took, uh, oh, uh, for her, uh, several months before she could really say that, uh, that she didn't believe them any longer. It took months for it to dissipate. Yes, sir. You've given us a very good picture of how influential a therapist can be yes. on patients. And I'm interested in what does go into informed consent documents and what should go into them when we're looking at therapy. If I go to a surgeon, the surgeon's view of life and values are not likely to influence me. I'm so but glad you asked that question. Let's add one more thing to it. Yeah. I've noticed talking to people having therapy over many years that drugs are being used increasingly and in an increasingly influential way. I don't know to what extent consent forms might say something about the theory of the pharmacology of company therapy, but I'm very much concerned with the informed consent side, especially since the patient may not even be competent to evaluate the form. This is a very important question. I devote a whole chapter in the book to it. <laughs> and one of the major failings in psychiatry, I believe, is not um, explaining to the patient at the beginning what you do as a psychiatrist. 
You know, we psychiatrists and some of us therapists presume that everybody, because therapy is everybody, everybody knows what they're supposed to do and what we're supposed to do. And it leads to all kinds of misdirections. And um, I believe there are two things that have to, to, to begin at the beginning. And, uh, uh, of course, when, you, when a patient comes to see you, he does come and offer himself for, for a diagnostic evaluation, and you say, well, I'm going to do this evaluation by asking you questions about yourself, and I'm going to um, uh, take a history from you. After that is done, a person, a psychiatrist, should do, do the following. First of all, he should explain to the patient what he thinks the problem is. And if the problem is something that he thinks medicines can help, some of the antidepressants, he should explain why he thinks that the symptoms of the patient are useful and what medicines have been used for this and what the side effects are and what the advantages are. Uh, Since all of us have discovered these medicines mostly by accident, I have to tell patients, look, I think this might help you. I'm not sure it will help you. It helps people who have similar symptoms. But here are the various side effects, and we'll follow it along. And if this doesn't work, um, we'll try something else. As well, if I think there's going to be psychological treatment involved, I do what is called a role induction. I say, look, I think that your problem is not of the kind that medicine is going to help, or if it is, you need something as well. You also need to understand how you are contributing to the problem out of the you know, out of aspects of your habits, aspects of your personality. You and I are going to talk about these matters and, and see if we can make sense of the symptoms from that point of view. But that means that... Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about what I think, and you've got to give me feedback about whether you think this is sensible or not. And as well, you've got to give me permission, if you would, to talk with a a person who knows you very well uh, just a little bit so that I can check out whether what you're saying to me and what I'm saying to you makes sense to somebody else. Will that be okay? because maybe you don't want to share this with somebody. This is called the role induction session. It lasts for about an hour, and it does a lot of good for the patient. It often does more good than the psychotherapy. The patient begins to think, oh, yeah, well, if it's the way we're thinking, and if you can help me, well, you mean I can argue with you? Yes, you can argue with me. Can you be right? Yes. Can you be wrong? Yes. We'll see it through. And uh, I do it that way. And if, they, and if you don't do it that way, in my opinion that um, you very often uh, get off to a very wrong footing. Now, the person who has explained it very well, if you want to look more closely, is is Aaron T. Beck and his Cognitive Behavior Psychotherapy books on how to do a role induction. Just one question. Sure. Go into what religious position or ethical position you take, or do you allow or invite a patient to ask are you going to do the therapy in a way that is agnostic or Christian, even if you don't say where you are? Right. Are you going to be a relativist about moral matters, or uh, do you have an objective view of some sort that you'd like to outline? I'm just wondering. Right. No, it's, 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 it's a very interesting question, too. And a one, because nobody comes to see me without knowing where I come from. They look at me and they say, oh, we know you, McHugh. <laughs> they, they see that Irish quality, you know, so I can't get away from it, and I'm proud of it, too. <laughs> um, but, look, in the initial eval- evaluation, um, uh, when I'm in- initially uh, asking the patient, I ask them, and we talk about their religious uh, uh, life and their religious persuasion, and um, they sometimes want to ask me about mine, and um, I, I, I tell them that I'm fairly orthodox and then move right on. Uh, but when it comes to the, 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 the therapeutic thing, uh, I'm telling them uh, uh, about issues and matters that are, are usually fairly personal and intimate, but uh, they certainly don't take a relativistic view of, uh, of, of what makes people flourish. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not baptizing anybody who comes to see me, but neither am I denying the fact that some kinds of ways of life um, which um, are being encouraged uh, out uh, uh, in the contemporary era are themselves the problem that they're having in 
their, their, their marital life, uh, life with their children and things of this sort. If I come to believe that uh, uh, people are horrendously uh, abusing their human nature, I'll tell them so. I say, you know, people can't live this way and the like. I, I, I often get into a little uh, debates with people about how they ought to live, you know, nowadays, and... Uh, when, we talk, when I start talking, they say, well, no, psychi- psychiatrists don't usually talk about this. I say, yeah, well, they should, because, you know, you're in difficulty. Yes, sir? Do you see any uh, for things like the dsm 4 Because in the work that I used to do, I would find that psychologists would use that oh, at least yes. simply to categorize sure. uh, and, and then to be able to arrange a course of treatment. I, I guess so, I didn't see it yes. used in yes. a harmful way as much as a descriptive way. Right. Is there a role for it in California? There is a field guide. And the role for a field guide is reliability. Okay? It's got nothing to do with truth, but it's reliable. And if you, if you have a, a discipline which is so primitive they can't even agree uh, as to what they're looking at, you can't do research. Okay? You can't say, I, did these result- I got these results with schizophrenics in Baltimore if we can't agree on what is a schizophrenic uh, in San Diego. So it serves that purpose. Okay? It serves wonders for research. And research, two kinds of people really love DSM. People who are doing research, they say, I don't care about the comprehensive aspects of psychiatry. I don't care if they're making up stuff about other things. I just want to know when I say obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm going to be able to get a grant for it if I use this. That's right. The other group are the forensic psychiatrists. They want to go into the court and say, this patient has got schizophrenia and she meets DSM criteria and nobody can argue with them. Nobody can say, oh, are you crazy? I mean, that's nuts. Because you, you, you can't do that. Then you say he's got ADHD or what have you. Everybody's got to do it for the forensics. It's killing this field, though, because now it's expanding. Everybody has his own disorder he wants in it, and he's got other disorders he wants out of it. Did you hear recently we're going to take narcissistic personality disorder out? Now, what does that really mean? Does that mean that it never existed in the past? Or it doesn't exist now? Or... or uh, uh, somehow or another, a group of experts have going to make... Look at what was expressed as a function of selfish attitudes towards life and given a kind of rubric narcissistic personality continues to exist. It always did exist. They're just not sure they can be reliable with it, so they're going to give up on it. Um, when this movement began back in 1980, I, I, w- I objected to it because I thought, gee, we're going to give titles and uh, without uh, generation. And then I was told, no, Paul, you're wrong. Um, uh, uh, reliability first and then validity. We're going to get the val- valid causes. We'll just give us a few years. That was 1980. This is 2010. A toll 30 years later, okay? DSM-5 is coming along. DSM-5 authors are saying, you know, all that research we did for 30 years, it's told us nothing. We've got to continue with the field guide approach because that's the only way. Well, now I'm quitting. I'm saying uh, this has got to, uh, I don't mind the reliability, but let's organize them, and that's what the last book was that I showed you. Let's organize them such that things which look like diseases of the brain are separate from things that look like the behavior disorders, from things that look like disorders that come from life encounters and, things, and, and, and assumptions about the world. If you know DSM, it has axis one. On axis one, there is anorexia nervosa, affective disorder, alcoholism, aging, now, it's obvious not an axis, you know. But anyway, that's another story. The problem was, if you made symptoms the calling card for diagnosis, anybody could get an entity into the, de- into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, into the manual if they could give you a set of uh, symptoms that they said they could recognize. And that's really the problem. And that's how multiple personality got in there. Yes, ma'am. The last phase on your timeline is the empirical phase. 
Yes. Can you comment on the key assumptions operating in that phase? In that empirical phase, it was. I use the word empirical. That's the phase in which they said, we're not going to concern ourselves with anything that relates to the essence or generation of these things. We're just going to identify uh, conditions according to their symptoms that experts tell us are identifiable. Let me say it differently. Can you tell what you think the weaknesses and strengths of that? Yeah, the, the strength was that liability to the to, so that people use the same words for defining uh, conditions. The weaknesses were that the conditions expanded uh, within themselves so that what used to be called uh, major depression encompassed a small number of people, and now the symptom clusters are, have increased so that it includes many, many more people within that cluster. And at the same time, new disorders kept being discovered by, because people said, well, I... I can recognize a set of symptoms so that the, the books, that, that little slide that I showed you, of small books growing larger and larger, that it expands uh, without, without limit. You can have uh, things, well, to, to use the field guide expression, you can have things which uh, are really varieties being called species and uh, expand in that fashion. And um, so the strengths were... Yes, we could use a common language. The weakness was that the common language didn't relate to nature. And we've gotten into this problem because of that. Sure. Maybe we don't have it. Yes, yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if this um, sort of unfortunate episode in the history of psychiatry with the uh, uh, psychiatrists using these really suggestive techniques and hypnosis to get repressed memories, if that... Uh, if there's any backlash against that, that is causing, you know, uh, people who are victims of abuse to not come forward, or uh, psychiatrists or therapists to not believe them as much, or courts to not believe them as much. Do you see any kind of... Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the last part. The psychiatrists didn't what? Do you think there's any backlash so that therapists may be oh, yes. believe sometimes what may be real uh, instances of abuse, which is still, you know, something that's really common that a lot of people well, don't well, I, I think that um, uh, two things have happened as backlashes to this. The first and most important backlash uh, is that I mentioned only at the beginning and I discuss in the book is uh, the development of distrust in psychotherapy. Okay? So the people who need psychotherapy think, I'm not going to go with those characters. They're going to ruin my life like, they've, like we've read, we read about in the papers. Now, I believe that psychotherapy is a very, as a, is, psychotherapy is nothing mysterious about it. It's a form of persuasion, okay? Persuading people to see how the uh, symptoms that they have can be understood in relationship to how they're looking at the world, okay? And that they can change the symptoms and change their future by uh, helping uh, change the way they're looking at the world. And they, they, they can get help for that. It's nothing mysterious. There's no magical thing. But it's really sometimes very helpful, particularly with people in distress. And I think that um, uh, the backlash of loss of confidence in a field that itself, as I told you, is, um, is uh, still a pretty primitive field, um, has, has hurt people. Uh, the other uh, backlash, of course, uh, is that uh, uh, now some people who have been sexually abused uh, are not believed that they were sexually abused, okay? Because uh, they think, well, you know, if you... Uh, and I'm saying that there are people out there that have been sexually abused, have forgotten about it in various ways, and, uh, and need, perhaps, uh, to get comfort again from realizing two things. One, that it did happen, and it shouldn't, therefore, though, determine everything about their future, okay? That it, it's a, a sad and, and grim event. Um, I had... Uh, uh, I felt that backlash, by the way, uh, once I'd made... Uh, 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 something of a reputation of, of refuting sexual um, uh, abuse charges. When I was put on the Catholic Bishop's uh, Council for the Protection of Children and Youth, the New York Times all came to my front door and said, why are they putting you on? You're going to just be the bishop's bowl. You're going to say that it didn't happen. Well, in those abuse cases, both, pa both the, the patient and the perpetrator agreed that the abuse had happened. I, I'm not, I don't 
disbelieve that sex abuse happens. It happens and it's a terrible thing and it has certain kinds of implications to it that uh, have uh, very serious uh, uh, fallout in the future. But the, but the problem is false accu uh, accusations or false thoughts about sex abuse is, is, is bad in itself as well. And uh, uh, you got to get to the truth. Bad things happen when, when, uh, when myths go through. Yes, further? Well, that's why I wanted to make my point about my four by my fourfold table or two by two. Uh, sometimes you're not sure, okay? Uh, and um, um, I believe, though, that when you're not sure, you shouldn't go proclaiming it into court, and you shouldn't put it in the newspapers, and you shouldn't fight with everybody when you when you're not sure about it. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, working uh, out what's the likelihood can, can be done by thinking in that two-by-two two way. Thank you very much. Please join us for the reception. Thank you.